Great. Well, good, well. Good morning. Uh, I'll just do a very quick you intro. Welcome. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. No <laughs> worries. Um, good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever y'all are located. Uh, we've got a session today. We're delighted to have uh, Negan share uh, the community of inquiry model and some aspects of creating and fostering interaction in online environment. And I'll spend a little bit of time after that talking about active learning and those kinds of dynamics. Uh, for those of you that haven't yet, please feel free to drop into the um, uh, discussion forum on edX, ask any questions. I'll talk about that a little bit at the end because we really want to get your feedback so that we can do a better job of addressing sort of content specific questions that you have. And if any of you are in a position where you want sort of local workshops uh, to, to your school, university system or whatever, if you have a specific local need, let us know as well because we, we can certainly discuss what that might look like and how we might be able to support you at that level as well. Anyway, for now, Negan, quick intro and kick it off. Fantastic. Thanks, George. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, my name's Negan. Um, I work at the University of South Australia in Adelaide, Australia, originally from Vancouver, Canada. Um, I've been involved in educational technology and online learning for well over 15 years. And dominantly, my work um, in that space has focused on helping academics develop their fully online um, courses, um, as well as some blended and flipped uh, classroom um, courses as well. But largely, it's been around online learning, um, whether that's the content creation end of it, the um, interacting with students end of it, um, or everything else in between. So. Um, today, we're, I'm going to speak about the community of inquiry model, and um, I'll, I'll put up my slides in a second. The topic is really around fostering interaction, but within a community of inquiry framework. So bear with me for a moment while I bring up my slides for you. There we go. Excellent. So this is our fourth live Zoom for our MOOC and it's the 19th of March, fostering interaction with these lovely happy kids in the corner. So this is the Community of Inquiry framework. Um, it dates back to 2000. Um, so it's not a new framework, but it has been used um, an incredible amount when looking at how students engage and interact in an online context. Um, particularly when we're trying to situate online learning with a mechanism where there's teacher presence, which is very important, social presence, that's that interacting bit between the students, and the cognitive presence, which is really that learning element and where students are able to scaffold their learning and self-regulate their learning. Um, but these three presences ultimately create that educational experience. The framework um, was designed by Garrison Anderson and Archer, um, phenomenal, phenomenal researchers in online learning and educational um, technology um, and distance education, really, because this is dating back to um, the early, early 2000s, um, where online learning was just at the cusp of starting off. But essentially, what we're going to do is I'm going to work you through these three different presences. And that's when I develop my online courses, this is usually the framework that I use in order to ensure that I'm covering everything off. So um, let's talk about teaching presence. And this is teaching presence in the online context. So this is where you're setting up your course structure, your curriculum, the activities, the assessments, the resources, selecting the tools and the technology. And we've talked about some of these this week. That's all part of your teacher presence. So teaching presence isn't necessarily you physically being present is that we sometimes think of teacher presence in the classroom. In an online context, it doesn't even need to be that teaching presence um, synchronously. It can be done asynchronously and it can be that actual instruction that's happening. Um, and it can be via text and it can be via video. It's that moderating and guiding discussion element. Um, so in discussion forums, including the ones in our course, um, when you pose a question, other students can answer it. Um, a number of us will also go in and moderate that discussion and answer question or pose more questions as well to you. So it's that moderating element. That direct instruction, and that's three presentations, <laughs> whether that's text, assessment, giving feedback to students, 
that's all that teacher presence. And a really clear important part is setting clear expectations. And that's probably um, actually one of the challenges with online um, course design and online teaching, especially when we're shifting from a face-to-face -face model. When it's face-to-face -face and then you're in the classroom, um, there's a lot more opportunity for students to ask questions in a way. It's, you have the opportunity to look at their faces and to see whether they understood what you're talking about. If you're trying to explain an assessment task, they can come and ask you quite easily, whether it's after class, before class, during class, or even just by the looks on their faces. You don't have that same sort of opportunity when you're teaching online. So it's really important to have those instructions really, really clear and set those expectations really, really clearly um, via text on your course, um, your learning management system or whatever mechanism you have for delivering your course to your students, because you just don't have that back and forth um, the way that you might be used to in a face-to-face -face setting. So that's teaching presence. Let's shift over to social presence. Now that could be personalizing um, a course with an introduction video. So um, in this edX MOOC, um, and those of us um, doing these various um, live sessions for you, did an introduction video, a really friendly, short video, introduce yourself, say what your background is, what, or talk about the course if you wanna talk about the course, give a little bit of personality to the course and um, explaining to the students why it's important that they learn the topic of the course. Um, it really helps personalize it when the rest of the course might be very asynchronous or text heavy um, by having that personal um, attention. And they're usually just, you know, a couple of minutes at best. Establishing trust um, is very important. And again, that's something that is more easily done face to face. So when you shift online, you want to be able to build mechanisms in place for students to be able to start trusting you and trusting each other. Um, typically, in an online course, you might create a form um, as an introductory form, asking students to introduce themselves to one another, share a tidbit of information with each other. Um, I often create a postcard form. I ask students to share with me a picture of a place that they visited that they'd like to share, and then ask each other to guess where that place is. So I might put a, a picture of a um, my trip to uh, my, my last skiing trip, for example, or a trip to the beach, and I want them to guess where that is. And it gives a little bit of an opportunity to have a little back and forth casual conversation as they get to know each other. Oh, you went here. Oh, how was that trip? Um, other times I've had a forum where I've actually asked them specifically, why are you in this course? What do you want to get out of this course? What's your background? Um, and they've shared those sorts of information. So it really kind of depends on the context, um, but it's that building trust, which is really important because later in the course, you want them potentially to engage in these forums um, more academically, um, maybe debate certain issues, and it's harder for them to engage in that space if they haven't gotten to know you and each other. So having that initial um, establishing trust sort of social forum is really, really critical. Addressing students by names is also, it makes a world of difference. Um, so in a forum, you know, saying, hi, Michelle, great comment, or um, sometimes what I, I would do instead of responding to every student that might be quite time consuming, is I might create an announcement at the end of the week that says, great discussion happening in this week. Um, James talked about X and Y, and Michelle chimed in and said, this. And by saying just those few names and every week kind of changing the names a bit, if you can, um, it actually does make a world of difference for the students because they see that they're being heard, um, that they're being seen, um, even if it's an online setting. And sorry, I think I skipped over cognitive presence. So cognitive presence is that learning element. Um, so that's where you want to set high expectations for your students to have that student inquiry, um, helping foster students to ask questions, having, helping students go out and find answers to those questions and bring it back to the course for learning. Developing learning activities that are really relevant, challenging, and engaging. Um, and that's, you know, when you try to build in some active learning elements, and George is going to speak to that um, shortly, 
really trying to probe students and challenge them. Um, so even though it's an online course, you really want to think critically about the types of questions you ask of your students, just like you would in a face-to-face -face setting. It's not really much different. Um, and, and probe them and ask them and try to engage with them in those sorts of conversations and in that cognitive learning element, encouraging them, coaching them through reflection, for example. Um, there are, I've often seen quite a bit of reflection um, occur in online courses, and that's largely because there often does tend to be um, maybe a lot of discussion happening, um, whether that's in a discussion forum or a wiki or a blog, the tool doesn't matter. Um, but then taking students, helping them take a step back and reflect on the conversations that are happening, helping them construct their knowledge in a sort of social constructivism um, approach, um, getting them to think about well, what what was your top three posts that you made this week and what did you learn from it or what did you learn from your peers posts and how did that challenge your thinking? Having them really think about the type of learning that they're having and the reflection around that. And that's social presence and we talked about that. So now I was just going to show you community of inquiry in action basically. I'm just going to show you a sample course um, that I taught recently. Um, which was on learning analytics. And so this is my little sample video um, or my introductory video um, that I posted for the students. A little bit narrative below it in terms of, you know, what's the course is about, but just a short, you know, two minute video introducing them to you um, and the course. This is what I call a need to know, need to do checklist. Um, it is fundamental, as I was saying, in an online setting to be really clear to students to what you want them to do, um, what they should know in order to be successful in your course. And I can't emphasize it enough how important it is to do that clearly when it's online versus face-to-face. -face. You have so much more opportunity face-to-face -to, -face to clarify the way that you're speaking to students that you just don't have online. So a little table like this spells it out really clearly for students. Well, this week, for example, we're talking about the origin of learning analytics. What do I need to know by the end of this week? What are those key concepts that my instructor wants me to know and it's spelled out there for them? And then what am I actually supposed to do? Because if you throw a lot of things at them, it's often hard for them to be able to know well, what's really required and what's optional. And we know our students, they're going to go for what's really required, what's going to get me through this, and especially right now with all the turmoil going on and um, they might be home taking care of their kids and studying you know, alongside that or worried about their parents and just the world in general. Um, they really want to know what do I need to do in order to survive the rest of this term? Um, you know, they don't want the frilly stuff. They don't necessarily want additional resources. Um, it's fantastic to provide optional additional supplementary resources and those that want to can take those up and further explore. But really clearly, what do I need to do in order to, to, to master this course? So here, for example, I've, um, and I've aligned them to each other as well. So if I want them to learn about the origin of learning analytics, that's the second one on the screen, watch a video by George Siemens, um, read learning analytics, the emergence of a discipline, and listen to a podcast by Professor Pardo. That's the three things that I think, as their instructor, they will need to do in order to achieve that particular objective, that need to know. So that's just a really clear um, teaching presence sort of thing. And I usually do this at the beginning of each topic or each week to make it really clear for students. The same with any activities I want them to do. Introduce yourself in a forum. Um, let me know when you're available for Zoom sessions. You know, those sort of things that I did in that first week. This is a schedule or course timetable. Um, again, really important for online learning because you want to make it so clear for students what they need to do um, each week when their assessments are due, so you don't get a you know, many number of emails asking you, when was that assessment due? What time was it due? I forgot really, really clearly. These are the topics we're going to cover, the dates that you, we expect you to cover them, um, and when your assessment's due. So that's all that teaching presence that you put online for the students. Um, this is um, an example of cognitive presence, and it's, don't worry about the image so much, but it's more just showing that it's an activity that I've built into the course. 
So while I have my students reading and engaging in conversations and all of that, I also get them to do a little bit of self-assessment um, type of activities where I might pose a question to them and then they can go in and answer the question. This particular activity was built in a technology called H5P, um, which is quite user friendly to use. And um, it happens to be available through our Moodle system. But basically that notion of giving students opportunity to think about what they're learning, um, apply it, check it, see how they're going before they get to an assessment task. Now I thought just before I end off that I would just share a few tips on how to foster interaction. So no surprise, clearly express your expectations. So students want to know where do you want them to interact? Is it the discussion forum? Is it the wiki? Is it Twitter? You know, what's the tool? Where is that location? And try to be consistent with that location across the term. If you switch around between a lot of tools too much, students can get lost. You know, if you're doing a forum one week and wiki next, they might not quite realize that that's where you want them to post their um, comments unless it's really, really clear for them. There's nothing wrong with using different types of tools and experimenting with it, but you just wanna make sure it's really clear what you want them to do and where. Off, it's easy to get confused in an online course if there's a lot of tools going on. Um, so you want them to know, okay, if you're using say a forum for certain um, types of posts, that's what that's for. You might use a wiki to share um, links to resources and you might use Twitter for some social community occurring outside of the class. How much do you expect them to interact with one another? Because um, quite frankly, that's what they want to know. Well, how many posts should I make? What does my teacher expect from me? If I'm being asked to interact and discuss, what does that actually look like? Try, try to be as objective and clear as possible. So on my rule of thumb, you know, usually is I'll say, okay, here's a question regarding a reading or a video or a topic make your initial post, then go and respond to two of your peers. Um, you know, that gives them a, a bit of guidance as to what you expect from them. Okay, I need to make an initial post, I need to read two of my peers' posts, and I need to respond to two of my peers. So it doesn't need to be those particular numbers. You could ask them to do two posts a week. You can ask them to respond to five peers if you, if you have a lot of students. You want to be mindful of their time, um, with any sort of online interaction, it tends to take a bit longer than face-to-face. -face. They have to read the post. They have to put a reply together. They have to post that reply. That takes time, so you want to be mindful of that, which is why I usually say just respond to a couple of your peers. Um, you probably want to give guidance as to how long that post should be, um, because without any sort of guidance, they might, some students might just write a couple lines and that might not be sufficient for you, or they might just say, yeah, agree. Yeah, uh, disagree. Um, if they're responding to their peers, it's, you know, no, we want them to say a bit more than well, why do you disagree? Or, you know, good comment, good post there, but it opened me up to thinking about certain other things. So you want them to be able to talk a little bit more in their pose than just a quick little response. On the flip side, you might not want them to write 500 words um, because that takes a long time to read. So giving them that sort of guidance will really help with that fostering interaction. You want to make sure it's clear for them why you want them to discuss. Now, discussion forums tend to be a very popular choice for online learning because they're in the learning management system. They're fairly easy to set up. They're great for the teacher to know who's responding and who's not because the, that data and those analytics are captured and easily readily available. Um, it's so easy to put in that you could put, you could, you know, go in and put in three or four a week. Um, the difficulty with it is they can be quite tiring. And if students don't realize why it's important to engage in conversation, they won't do it. So you need to be really explicit. Why do you want them to make this post? Think about when it's actually useful to have a discussion forum. You don't, they don't need to discuss every reading. They don't need to discuss every video. They don't even need to have a discussion forum every week. Think critically about what are those topics that might lend themselves best to a bit of a debate. You don't want them to all answer the same answer, like everyone to have the same post. 
That's not a forum, that's not a discussion. So think about what a discussion would look like in class and then think through what those questions are and then it's really clear what those objectives are as well. And finally, a bit of a netiquette reminder. If they're new to online learning, which many of them might be, just that notion of respecting one another online, just as we respect each other in the classroom. We use appropriate language online. Um, you know, some, some teachers say, I want my students to use academic language when they're posting um, to a forum, for example. And others might say, no, casual is all right. Um, but you need to make those parameters really clear for your students and also let them know if there's disrespectful language um, or disrespect happening in the forums that you're going to take it down, you're going to close it, you're, you're going to delete those particular comments that are inappropriate. And setting all that up really clearly for students from the start um, really helps build that sense of trust as well. Um, be the guide on the side, um, steer those conversations when necessary, you've posted a question, let them discuss. If they're not discussing, you might want to jump in and probe another question. Or you might see that someone's kicked off a bit of a conversation, but there's not a lot of people chiming in. So you might want to chime in and raise another question that might then probe others to join in. And I mentioned it before, acknowledge those student contributions and activities, summarize discussions um, if you, because you might not have time to actually engage with everyone. Having that summary can be really useful and use your students' names. Um, and finally, if you are using tools that are in your learning management system, but also if you're using tools that are outside of it, you could very well have access to the analytics related to it. So like I said, with forum posts, for example, you could see which students are engaging and when they're not. Um, or when they last logged into your course, for example, it's really critical um, to, to, to look at that because if your students aren't engaging, you want to know as quickly as possible so that you can act on that. Um, if they're just switching from um, learning dominantly face-to-face -to, -face to online, they might not realize what they really need to be doing in that online space or how often they need to be logging in. So it's good to just check on those sort of analytics. Usually it's under a report section. That's usually what it's called. Um, because if they're not engaging, if you notice, for example, that Simon's just hasn't come in, um, it's been a week, it's been two weeks now, he hasn't engaged in any of the discussions, um, you know, you can send a private message or an email just to check off on him. How are you doing? Are you feeling all right? Did you know that we had a discussion happening this week that was due the other day? Um, do you have questions about the assessment? You know, what's, what's happening? And it might just be that he's been ill or sick. It might just be that he's had a personal issue going on, or it might be that he actually has a technical issue um, and he didn't know how to reach out to you. So you, when you're taking that active um, approach, it really then, again, it helps with that interacting, fostering of interaction, that building of um, rapport between you and the students and that sense of trust all together. Um, so I do encourage you to try to find the report section or analytics sections of where you can, of the various tools you're using, just so you can check in on those students that aren't engaging. Um, that's it for me, really, just some high level resources there for you in case you wanted to explore more the community of inquiry um, or introduction to learning analytics and reports. Um, that's all, I'm happy to answer any questions. All right. Thanks, uh, thanks, Megan. And for others, as I mentioned, once we officially kick off the course next week, as you all are aware, we're technically, this is sort of a quick ground zero week. The more substantive activities begin uh, on week one, on, on Monday, and we'll have a biblio uh, uh, related to course materials and content resources available there to give you a little bit of guidance. A couple of questions that came in. Uh, one was regarding uh, wanting to get some ideas on how to pose discussion board posts that really encourage discussion and not just a quick agreement or response. Megan, what do you think? So as open-ended as you can make them, you don't want them closed questions, but I, I touched on that briefly in that um, you want a question that students can actually debate about and maybe have different views on. So if it's a question um, that the answer is in, a, in, in your course content, clearly, you're going to get the same response from everybody. But if it's a question that say says, you know, you've read this reading, well, what's your perspective on it? Or relate it to your own context, relate it to your experience, that's going to make it personal for every student because they have had slightly different 
backgrounds and contexts and experiences. So I think trying to get more of that personal perspective in um, encourages more of that interaction because somebody will explain their situation and how it relates to your reading or your video or whatever content it is um, to engage in it that way. Or you could open it up into a bit of a debate even, have two different sides. You can assign students and say, you know, you're taking this particular view on this topic. This other group is taking this other view on this topic. So that their posts are in relation to the, the side that you um, assign to them instead of the one of what they're choosing. But that's, that's the notion is really what's, and that's why I do encourage not having a lot of discussions because you can also get discussion fatigue um, where students will might start engaging early on and slowly drift off. Having too many forums um, is so, so common in online courses. I see it all the time. Um, really just bearing it down to maybe one a week at best um, and trying to put more of a debatable type of question in. It will depend on your course Sorry. content, of course. All right, uh, thanks, uh, Negan. There's another follow-up there, which is uh, to clarify around the topic of uh, teaching presence. And so the question is, the person who offers a teaching presence, uh, presence you know, does not need to be the person featured in the video. I'm not quite sure if I interpret that question correctly, but if you just want to articulate the that that aspect of what teaching presence is and what that might look like in an online course. Sure. So teaching presence um, takes a variety of formats. It is that direct instruction. It is that content that you actually put on the course um, because you're not necessarily lecturing per se, your content is coming through the various material that you pull together for the course. That's an example of teaching presence in and of itself. Um, your presence in the forums or interaction is a form of presence. The videos that you provide, now you can have introductory videos, you can have content bearing videos, you can have a video like what we're doing today. I think, I suppose it, it doesn't necessarily need to be the person delivering the course, if that's what the question is. So some of the courses that we design, um, the person that's actually in the videos is not the person delivering or facilitating the course, it's the content expert. Um, so it really depends on your situation. There are courses where the content expert is the one who's delivering the course um, and is featured in all the videos, and that's a great example of teaching presence. We have lots and lots of courses where the content in the course, the videos, for example, are not featuring the person who's delivering it. It's featuring the person who knows that topic. Um, and that's completely fine. So that's almost like two different teaching presences coming together, really. The person who's facilitating might be sending out the announcements and the discussions and that sort of thing, the actual delivery and day-to-day -day element. And the other teaching presence is actually that content expert who created the videos to begin with. Does that answer the question? I think it was Derek that posed that question. There's any redirect, any redirect I'll throw your way. There was another point before we shift on to the next section, but what advice do you have about it? evaluating the quality of posts and obviously when you're doing a lot of interaction online part of the intent because we are a university is we need to grade and get some sense of the quality of a student's understanding what do you do look at when you're evaluating quality so i suppose um it depends on on your assessment and what you're trying to um assess in a post um, and the type of discussion. So generally speaking, um, I mean, the way I do it essentially is I don't mark every discussion post. Um, I, I treat the discussion as an opportunity for students to share and grow their knowledge um, constructively together. Um, however, there are times when I've taught and I've asked students to say share their best, what they think are their top three posts in the semester and they share those top three ones with me. And I might actually mark those and give a grade to those top three. I'd be looking at um, the level of reflection that they have in their post, um, the critical thinking that's come in and into the way that they responded to the initial question. Um, I might be interested at looking at how they responded to their peers, um, whether they shared additional resources to their peers, if that's one of my criteria, um, or whether they um, 
responded to their peers and extended whatever the peers had said. So if it was just, um, if I'd asked them that to respond to each other and the comments were more like, yes, I agree, or good point, but nothing further, then I probably wouldn't value that as highly. But all of that um, criteria, essentially, I'd be clarifying at the beginning. Do you have an example of a rubric for grading a discussion online? Um, I don't have a rubric specifically for discussion. However, what I have done is um, I've, I've, actually, maybe actually I do have, is I've had assessments where I've asked students to post um, in the forum and I've asked students to respond to one another and I've actually, and I've got standards and criteria as part of it. So it's one component of their assessed piece is discussion of the assessment. So it's not the entire one, but a component of it is a discussion. And I can try to see if I can find some examples and share them via the course. Sure. Great, thanks, uh, Negan, for that overview. And, and I will say for, for all of you, as we get moving into the course itself, we do have a you know, number of resources, whether those are templates and uh, rubrics and other things that, that will be shared uh, going forward. And in particular, I would encourage others who have already developed parts of this to share what they have. So uh, if you have a group of people involved in a course like this, chances are all of the problems that one, you know, that we have are solvable by solutions that others have experienced. And that's a big part of, I think, the point that we're trying to address here is the, the need and the value of being involved in engaged active learning. And we've selected the community of inquiry model simply because it provides the broadest spread for new faculty or teachers new to the online environment uh, regarding how to think about this space and how to think about your teaching and learning practices. And so there's a, a number of other frameworks. We're going to keep returning to the community of inquiry model just for the onboarding value that it has for people in this space. Now I'm going to start sharing uh, a, a brief uh, discussion here around active learning. So the slides will come up here in a second. One of the uh, the things that I think all of you are facing is as you begin to transition into different environments for teaching and learning, and if you haven't engaged extensively online, there is a bit of a natural inclination to become conservative and to resort to things that you have greater control over that you're more comfortable with, which for many teachers or faculty ends up being the prospect of teaching. And by teaching, I'm referring to you go out and, and you lecture. Now, I'd like to really encourage you to focus on you know, Zoom or synchronous technologies as being a very specific type of tool in a much broader set or suite of tools that you can use to promote proper learning environments or experiences for your students. We've said this many times, this isn't a normal cycle for moving online. There aren't going to be the proper attention to learning design and support for creating the richest student experience possible just by virtue of it being a forced or a coerced experience of getting people online. Uh, one of the things is Zoom and other tools that allow us to talk because it allows us the most direct pathway to communicate our expertise are naturally a desirable approach, but they also have a range of drawbacks. One of the things for those of you that do use Zoom early on or any kinds of other synchronous tools, I encourage you to record the recessions that you've recorded, spend some time listening to your recordings of, of what you've done because you'll find, and this is something I did early on, is that you'll find that there are mannerisms and approaches to speaking and little glitches that you do and what you do with your hands and your eyes and your whatever else that can actually be insightful for you to learn about. And your students experience it directly. So I'm trying to say as you do a recording, you view your recording. What's the state of your ums and ahs? And what's the state of your distractedness? And do you have like some odd little mannerisms that you might not even be aware of, but that your students will be aware of? So I'm just emphasizing the recordings as an opportunity for self-reflection, self-learning, because you may come to know things about yourself in a lecture format online when you view a recording that you might not have been aware of previously. With that said, though, Zoom is helpful for a bit of social cohesion in a course, a bit of social presence, but it's not really the best mechanism for teaching and cognitive presence. So we want to focus really on engaged, active, or problem-based learning to the degree that it's possible. And the online environment is really good for that because it gives students a chance to share what they know, 
students a chance to build on work that others have done versus just listening to what you have to say and then regurgitating it back to you either in the form of a quiz or a test or even an essay and an assignment. So the intent is to really drive students doing things versus students sitting and watching. And there's a range of things that they can do in this process. And we take this from a perspective of cognitive science, which really emerged in prominence in the 50s, partly in response to where behaviorism was going and the shortcomings of behaviorism. And while cognitive science is still the primary area of research interest to understanding learning within the psychology domain, there was a development of learning sciences in, that grew in prominence roughly uh, in, in the 1980s, which was a response to the somewhat mechanistic view of learning as discrete processes that came from cognitive sciences. So learning sciences and a range of other terminologies such as uh, was mentioned by, by Negan just a few minutes ago in her talk, the development of social constructivism or constructivism in general fit into that profile, which is less interested in discrete learning and knowledge processes, but is more interested in the broader approach to learning and learning experience and students being actively involved and engaged in that process. Now, at the same time, while the you know, behaviors to cognitive science, cognitive science to integration into learning sciences was occurring, there was also a separate strand that developed prominently at least in a pronounced way since the 1960s with the launch of the Open University UK. It goes back, and actually it should be 1900s, not 1990s, but distance education goes back uh, to hundreds, of, you know, 100 plus years minimum. And those of you uh, that uh, have are familiar with some of the religious scholars' work, uh, say the Apostle Paul and others, they were essentially involved in approaches of distance education already in terms of writing texts and sharing them with remote populations and churches, something that's been duplicated with Bhagavad Gita and a range of other religious texts as well. So it's not new. It works well. It is effective, but questions do arise around how effective is it compared to what happens in a classroom environment, and can we have a good degree of trust in this environment if it's properly designed? Part of the bibliography that we're going to share with you as we go forward is this idea of meta-analysis and trying to understand, like, how does this differ? Is there a quality experience, and what might we do in order to structure it in such a way that the learning performance and outcomes are significant? I'll say, make a caveat here. What you're doing now without a properly designed course, you should expect at best to cover half of the curriculum that you would regularly cover in a week in a classroom. The reason being, there are a series of longer term strategies around planning learning outcomes, designing learning activities, and then doing the assessment of that that has a unique set of dynamics online that you don't experience in a classroom. Active learning often takes longer than lecture-based learning because with lecture learning, we just say the thing that we need people to know. We assess that. We're not necessarily evaluating the depth or the quality of that learning simply because we rely on scale-based learning approaches such as tests and evaluations that don't have that kind of nuance. So I'm just saying that up front. Don't expect that you can cover your curricular material in a short cycle like we're dealing with right now. So be compassionate to yourself in that regard and realize that yes, the medium is comparable to in-classroom instruction, uh, work that Barbara Means uh, focuses as well, coming off the Bernard and Abrami work that I referenced on the previous slide. Essentially, the research says, and the US Department of Education released a meta-analysis on this in 2014 as well, that these environments are comparable, learning outcomes are comparable. In some cases, blended is actually preferable to either exclusively online or exclusively in classroom. Those of you that want to do a deeper dive of the literature, I'd encourage you to Google no significant difference. There are a number of resources and studies and meta-analysis that can basically say, at the end of the day, the environment, online or in classroom, can produce comparable outcomes. A large part of it is a function of design and the role of the teacher and the educator, which is why we settle on the community of inquiry model, because it provides the social, the teaching, and the cognitive presence that's required for key academic success. Now, with that said, active learning matters a lot. And work that Scott Freeman did out of University of Washington 
really address this. The fact that if you have students involved in active learning processes, the results are quite clear. There is a dramatic improvement in their academic performance versus traditional lecturing. And this holds true for physical or online environments. I would say without having research to back it, but Intuitively, I would suggest that it makes an even bigger difference online because sitting in front of a Zoom room for hours and hours listening to a lecture, there's far too many distractions. Just think of what you're doing right now. Some of you likely have a phone in your hand. You may be following social media. Some of you have multiple tabs open. You have my melodious voice in the background gently serenading you and you're engaged in a range of other activities that if you were physically in a room with me and I was lecturing at you, you would be more present than you could be in the online environment. So my hypothesis is that active learning is more critical to academic performance online than it is even in a physical environment due to the ease of being distracted with technology. So let's talk a little bit about the. Uh, tie these knots together. Nagin talked about community of inquiry. I've addressed the cognitive science to learning sciences framework and then the simultaneous shift going on with the distance education and online learning literature, which is extremely deep and goes back at least 50 to 60 years in terms of guiding us and what we do in our classroom settings. With that said, there's a few key cognitive aspects that I want to promote or focus on that sort of tie these together. There's a heavy role on students and the particular pathways or the particular activities that they engage in when they learn online. Things like self-regulation and attention management matters. Active encoding during the learning process is consequential. Multi-pathway engagement, meaning not just curriculum but or lecture format, but engaging in teaching and learning in a range of different ways, whether that's group-based, lecture-based, discussion-based, creating artifacts, and so on. And something that I find to be more and more critical is the mental states of our learners and obviously also the faculty. It's more pronounced with our learners today and with faculty, given the stress that many of us are feeling around COVID and wondering what's the economy going to look like? How are my parents doing? How are my children doing? How do I deal with my child in the room over there that's not going to school anymore yelling for my attention while I'm in the middle of an online session or teaching and the list goes on. So there's a number of factors that come into play. And I want to talk a little bit about a few of these key elements and how they actually impact learning. So first of all, note taking is it is an effective approach to learning, but what's more consequential is the review process. So while it's helpful for students to take notes and you seen literature I'm sure over the last while, last couple of years that emphasizes handwriting notes produces better performance than taking notes on a computer. But as all of you are aware, there are so many factors in play in the learning process that you can't say anything generally about learning that's disconnected from the context in which learning happens. So if somebody says lecture is a lecture format is not as effective as active learning, that may be true, but if that lecturer happens to be Richard Feynman, then that kind of skews that whole discussion or that whole relationship. So I think that's one of the key things that we need to try and look at and focus on is context matters more than any individual learning strategy. All of you are now in a fairly complicated context and more than anything else, care and concern and connection with your students is going to make a bigger impact than any particular teaching and learning strategy. But note taking again, and the reason I emphasize this is learning is essentially a process uh, where we want to move concepts and ideas from some process of engagement at a working memory level to a long term memory approach for subsequent retrieval. Note taking works if we actively promote that encoding, but even then, the review is the most critical part of it. Another aspect that does help improve learning is interleaving, which is you move across a range of different topics rather than spending six hours on one topic. It does reduce the performance during learning, but it has a better long term impact, which means when you're lecturing or working with students, especially keeping in mind that they have multiple courses, multiple classes, spread out some of the key concepts and keep visiting and touching on them again. Collaborative learning which really in many ways is the native space of the online environment, meaning everybody has a voice, everybody has the ability to communicate and share their ideas. 
There's a coordination challenge though. If you take a group of students who have various technology access, some have webcams, some don't. Some have access to good Wi-Fi, some don't. If you ask them to collaborate synchronously, such as meet via any one of the collaborative tools that are now available, or if you ask them to meet via threaded discussion forums and so on, you're going to have uneven impacts in collaborative learning. So collaborative learning and engaged learning is critical and effective, but be aware that the various types of technology students have access to are going to produce potentially uneven impacts and may even be distracted. It's helpful though, if there is some grounding in the motivational strategies that you've set for the course, and I'll talk about that a little bit on the next slide. Self-explaining is a very active approach to learning. I think it's important to emphasize that Active learning does not mean that you're doing jumping jacks while you're watching an exciting video in a MOOC. Active learning doesn't require that people have to physically be doing things with their hands. Active learning is a mental activity. It means you're not passively sitting there listening to a lecture. It means you're being led in self-questioning. It means that you're being asked critical questions that you need to think through and then answer and so on. So I just want to emphasize that active learning is an internal mental state and someone who is listening to a lecture and has been taught good interrogation techniques in a well-developed lecture is actually engaged in active learning in a more substantive way than somebody that's involved in an ineffective group project where people haven't been given the skills to effectively coordinate and collaborate their work. A um, couple other points, the uh, aspect of distributed practice or the spacing effects, this is fairly well known in uh, learning sciences literature in particular. It is basically you have key ideas and you return to them. And generally I look at a course pulling things together. I look at what are the critical nodes that have been structured here and then return to those key nodes at regular points. So most courses don't have more than five or six or seven big ideas. Those big ideas are, for lack of a better word, the scaffolding on which all of the smaller ideas hang. And it's critical to keep focused on those big ideas and to return to them regularly. And this also contributes to better encoding and longer term memory. And then of course, self-regulation is where we want individuals engaged in managing their performance, monitoring and active learning. Another uh, final technique to just emphasize briefly is the concept of elaborate interrogation, which is if you have children, you know it's the why. It's the why, the why, the why. You just keep asking until you hit a wall. And so these are skills that we want to promote in our students, and Nagin touched on this. There are ways that you can build it into your curriculum and your teaching practices that fosters this level of whying, if you will. Ask students to ask those questions of themselves. So if that's the case, and a lot of the, the points I just touched on the previous slide, this is, or the previous set of slides, I'd encourage you to look at Dunlosky's work, who actually was going to be a keynote speaker at the Learning Analytics Conference, where many of us were going to be in Germany, actually this next week, but of course we are not. I, I'd encourage you to look at uh, this particular paper, which does a nice job of looking at the range of strategies that can be used and which ones actually have a broad impact on effective student performance. But I wanna emphasize again, None of this matters if it's disconnected from context. Everything should be contextually articulated. So final points, what are some of the things that you might wanna do? Well, here's a few approaches. One, I strongly encourage you to promote reflection and self-interrogation. This is why blogs can be so effective or discussion forums can be quite effective if you've structured them properly. What you want students to do is to actively engage with the concepts of the course. You want them to question it, to provide counter perspectives on it or to enrich it. You also wanna ask students at some level to think about their own goals. Why are they here? What do they want to achieve? Many cases it's like, well, I'm just here because I showed up, but ask them specific questions. What are your outcomes and what do you want to achieve while you're involved in this uh, approach, this course? Ensure that you return to the five or six key ideas in a course regularly. I start all my courses, whether it's online or on campus with an opening period of what did we do last week? And I advise students at the beginning of every session, when you're done a course, take five minutes and sketch out the key ideas, visualize them or however you want to, pen and paper, iPad, carve it on your desk. At the start of a class, before the course begins or the lecture begins again, reflect what you did last week. 
and what did we cover and how do those pieces connect? And I generally encourage students to develop a long-term concept map of course material that you add to on a weekly basis. So over time, you can see the integrative structure of the course material. Uh, metacognitive skills, this is something that you build into a properly designed learning course, uh, or learning resources. You may not have time to do that in the current approach to online. You may not be able to address the metacognitive angles, but many of you are facing a twofold reality. One is, what the hell do we do now? Because that's a critical question and all of you are facing this rapid online. The second is what do we do come September when we have a little more time? And right now there's no indication that we have a confident perspective that by September things will be normal. So you're simultaneously trying to stay alive with teaching today, but recognize that there's a longer term impact. So we're trying to introduce some concepts that you'll need to reflect on over time. And I've already touched on the idea of promoting connectivity between concepts through self-reflection and asking students to visualize, draw it out and so on. Tools that you can use, discussion forums, reflective writing and blogs. I use a lot of concept mapping software. Keep in mind, I'm not talking mind mapping, which has a central node. Concept mapping like CMAP or visual understanding environments are the ones that I look at. Perhaps more than anything else, though, is uh, anything that creates an artifact. When we create artifacts, we make our internal learning transparent. When you ask students to do that, by virtue, they become teachers. This is a critical distinction. So when you make your learning transparent as a student, you teach other students who then encounter those artifacts. That's where you move from a teacher-centric to more of an active learning kind of an approach and a model. So on that note, I am going to stop sharing here. I saw a few questions come in, so I'm pretty sure I missed a whole ton of those there. But uh, if there's any uh, comments that anybody wants to have in the last six minutes before we wrap up, I'm happy to pause. A quick point, I just saw Lorraine's question there. Um, I use CMAP is a good one to download. Um, it's a literally, and that, that's based on Novak uh, work, who's done quite a bit of work with concept mapping. There's another one, Visual Understanding Environment, VUE, that you can look at. Those are both uh, free downloads, so feel free to, to have a look at that and, and dive in in detail if you would like to. All right, I'll wait a moment, see if there's any questions. Otherwise, we are going to, to wrap up shortly. Oh, Tanya, thanks for sharing the discussion rubric. Great stuff. I'm sort of going back through this, so. There's a question here. Would it be worth assigning students key concepts to create videos to teach each other? Would this be, uh, you know, active learning or is that the active explaining learning? It, it does. So I want to emphasize again that what matters most in this short term cycle of getting stuff online is demonstrating care, concern and connection to your students more than anything else. They're as confused as you are. And by connecting well with your students, I think you'll find it's a form of self therapy as well, because they're going to give you guidance, feedback and suggestions that are going to help you improve the quality of your own teaching. And you'll find out quickly they want you to succeed. Most of them will. There's a few that can be a little bit cantankerous online. I'm not sure if you all have heard, but there can be some difficult people on, on the Internet. So I would encourage you to begin by in asking uh, students what they would like, partnering with them, experimenting, doing some trial balloon work, and then getting their feedback. But absolutely, students should be comfortable. For example, if you're talking a certain topic in chemistry, break it up into teams. You got six teams in a class of say 30 and you say this team is working on this topic this team is working on that topic for this week you get together as a group collaboratively you can do it via email you can do it via zoom you can do it via slack whatever you want uh, some of the like slack for example is an open tool not open but it's a free tool that they can use and they can then pull it together and then you meet for group presentations the following week so that's the intent of active engagement is people need to create things and the things they're creating are at ideally, if you will, a reflection of their internal mental states and understanding. Um, you know, it's a good point. Would students see that as us being lazy? I would hope not because once they've seen the value of learning in a connected, integrative way, in a way that promotes them sharing with others what they've learned, they generally see the value of it pretty quickly. Now, keep in mind, 
not everybody likes group work. And that's just a, an attribute. Like generally, if I'm at a conference and someone says, all right, everybody go into groups, then I'm like, well, I'm going to sneak out the back door as soon as I can. But online, that often works quite well because you can share ideas asynchronously, at least in, in generally in a more effective way. So, but even then, you will find students complaining or maybe no, complaining is the wrong word. You'll find it doesn't resonate with all your students. The reason it doesn't resonate is that is something they're not familiar with. They, there's legitimate social anxiety issues that they might be facing and so on. So those are the kinds of dynamics that you need to continue to focus on. Um, and uh, hello to BLCG2. Uh, it's good to meet you and have you here as well. Yes, uh, thanks, Tanya, for mentioning that. I'm going to make that as a conclusion and a wrap up. I think there's a lot of uh, value in the discussion and the assessment end. And we have um, we have Tanya and Justin. Uh, get your act together, George. We have Tanya and Matt who will be hosting that discussion tomorrow. On that note, I am going to end the recording. Thanks all. Tomorrow, same time, same place. We kick off on Monday with a more focused set of guidelines on how to rapidly move.